So the next speaker is uh, Tuomas Koskela from UCL. And uh, Tuomas will talk about uh, the development of portable scientific applications uh, using Zikl. Thank you. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a senior RC at UCL. Um, my background is in developing large HPC plasma physics simulations for CPUs using things like Fortran and MPI and OpenMP. I think this is the first time ever that I give a talk about GPUs, so bear with me. Um, but I'm, I'm very much going to continue on the theme of, of abstracting away the GPUs and, and uh, seeing what kind of, what, what kind of a interface to the programmer we can provide. Um, so I'm going to talk about this work on uh, developing applications using SQL. I'll talk about a bit about what SQL is in a moment. If, if you're not familiar, don't worry. Um, so this is work we did with DRAC. DRAC is a sort of organization that provides HPC support for various theoretical physics fields in the UK. Um, and there's been a lot of people involved in this work. Most of them are in the room, I think. So thanks all for coming <laughs> by. Uh, um, Right, so, so let's start. And, and I want to start with a bit of motivation. So the title, I want to say, this is a personal opinion from someone already quite set in their ways. Um, but like Paul just said, programming GPUs is quite hard. Programming CPUs in parallel is also quite hard. And the thing that's happening right now is that you're going to have to do both if, you, if you're going to run big HPC simulations. Um, so, so this is a slide from the U U.S. Uh, Department of Energy's HPC roadmap. I like to refer to them about things in HPC because they have a huge amount of money to throw into this, and, and they're pretty open about the open science part of their HPC program, which is not all of it, but gives you some idea. And, and, and so what, what they are going to do for the next few years is they're going to have three systems in, in, the, in the national labs. Um, one with AMD GPUs, one with NVIDIA GPUs, one with Intel GPUs. So they are like spreading their bets over what's going what's gonna to work the best for, for scientific applications. And, and they're working hard on developing scientific applications that will run on these things. Um, so, I mean, Frontier already exists, and Frontier has brought us Exascale. Uh, uh, Perlmutter is a kind of a pre-Exascale system in, in NERSC, and, and Intel is, uh, sorry, um, Aurora is, is coming online soon, I, I believe, um, although it has been coming soon for the past five years. Um, so, so what everyone by now should be pretty clear on that HPC computing, and not just US, but everywhere, will be, will be accelerated. So, so if you want to use these big computers, you're going to have to acknowledge GPUs in some way. Otherwise, you're leaving most of the performance on the table. And, and like you see here, then they, they highlight, like, what is the programming model? So for AMD, use HIP. For NVIDIA, use CUDA. For Intel, use SQL. This is, so, so you're going to have to write your, your application three times if you want to use all of these things. And, and, and they, they come up with possible strategies, and you see a theme here, abstract the differences, let someone else abstract the differences, um, <laughs> or rely on a standard that abstracts the differences and tells you what it's doing. Um, so, so very much like we, we want to use the GPUs, but we don't want to think about them. Um, oh yeah, so how does the, how does the situation look, in the, look like in the UK. Um, I, I listed the Dirac systems here because Dirac was, was supporting this work. It's in general in the UK, we're a bit more NVIDIA based at the moment, but things can change. Um, if you don't want to take my word on it, this is, this is I want to plug in the, the Excalibur program who are doing this kind of Exascale exploration work in the U in the UK, 
and they've got this uh, hardware en enabling software project that is bu building test beds with new technology and there's lots of stuff here there's graph core there's fpga there's amd gpus there's lots of things and and we don't know we don't know what is going to turn out working the best so so that's the thing and we don't want to write our applications five times so what can we do and and sickle is is something that i i was interested in dirac was interested in a bunch of other people were interested in so we thought let's have a look um so so yeah i forgot to say this talk is very much about this like progress of exploring a new programming paradigm let's say um i'm not gonna have very pretty results but i will try to talk through <laughs> what we what we found um so sickle is a, is a is a is the the third option in the strategy so it's a, it's an open standard um intel at the moment is promoting it quite heavily but it's it's run run by this uh, group called chronos and there's people developing implementations for it um and and one of them is is part of intel's uh, one api product so you may hear me interchangeably using sickle one api and dc plus plus at a very rough level they mean the same thing they mean this language that implements the sickle standard that you can compile using a is using intel's compiler um or or other compilers so so the the ones we kind of targeted in this work were uh dpc plus plus compute cpp which is developed by a company company called codeplay and and hipsicl which is developed by uh, the university of heidelberg in germany and and you can kind of see here on the bottom they list what are the backends you can compile into and so intel will support intel gpus they also will support nvidia and amd uh, codeplay will support nvidia um, other things uh, intel and so on so so they all like give you these promises of of all the things you can you can use if you compile your code with this thing um and i'll talk a little bit about that later um so what is what is sql code like um so i just wanted to show a very simple example from james reinders uh book about sql this so this is a we're, we're computing z equals ax plus y so sucks p if you speak linear algebra um and in in good old fortran you you do a loop from one to n you add element wise your vectors and and you're done and and in sort of old old style c plus plus you do the same um and and in the bottom here i have the same thing in sql and you can kind of see that the block of the work the the body of the work here looks precisely the same as the c plus plus loop but but it's it's got stuff around it that will <laughs> tell the compiler how to how to run this thing on different architectures and worry about the implementation you know, like decide what the best implementation is so there's this my queue object which is a queue that is like sits on a particular device on your system and you can pass work to the queue and the queue will schedule that work and then come back to you when it's done um, and and you call a parallel for which is kind of telling telling it that i want to do a series of things on 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 data in parallel and then you pass in a lambda function which says uh, i want to operate on a range of size n uh, using an index i and and do this calculation um, so i mean if you if you're used to programming gpus this will seem quite natural because it's it's basically the same thing and then at the end you wait because you it's it's done asynchronously so you're not you don't know when it's gonna finish um okay so that's like the introduction to to sql and why why i thought it was important um and i'm gonna sort of move towards the messy reality of things 
Uh, so, so our project ran for six months, and, and the objective was to, to sort of explore the feasibility for uh, research teams, so, so for teams who are not necessarily experts in programming, to, to use uh, primarily the one API tools, but possibly other, other compilers as well. Um, and you'll see why in a moment, uh, to, to achieve code portability. So, so if, if you've got a um, Flame GPU, for example, that's <laughs> been written for NVIDIA, and suddenly Archer 3 has AMD, what do you do? You can rewrite it from scratch, but, or, or you can port it into a, a language like SQL that will run everywhere. Um, and, and basically all the people on my title slide who worked on this didn't have a lot of SQL experience to begin with, and, and we were a mix of RSCs and researchers, all quite familiar with, with programming, obviously, and, and quite somewhat familiar with GPUs. Um, and we picked some codes that, are, that were real scientific applications that Dirac is using and, and that are producing important science for Dirac. And, and I believe they all had, had already GPU ex implementations, so we had something we didn't have to write the GPU implementation, we just had to port it to, to SQL. Um, I'll, I'll show you a bit more about the codes on the next slide. Um, we, had, we had access to a few different systems, so, so in Intel, so we got, we, we got, like Intel was supporting us via the Cambridge uh, Open Exascale Lab, because I'm not allowed to say the other thing anymore. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm not allowed to joke about it. <laughs> um, okay, fine. Um, anyways, so Intel gave us access to their development cloud where they have some Intel CPUs and, and sort of low power GPUs. Um, you get one API there automatically, so it's kind of nice. You, you can just start running things. Um, it obviously doesn't play well, very well with NVIDIA because of issues between commercial companies. Um, we, had, we had access to, to the CSD3 system on, in Cambridge, where we had very helpful support from the local RSC team on, on setting things up. And, and we had access to other Dirac systems with um, less local support, let's say. Um, so, so there, oh, OK, I, mixed, I shuffled my slides, slides around. So, so, so why we thought one API might be useful is that they provide some tools for porting existing code to SQL that does a lot of automatic, a lot of sort of translation work automatically for you. Um, so if you have a CUDA code, they have this uh, DPC++ compatibility tool that will generate some SQL code for you, and then you can uh, sort of analyze it, profile it, uh, Make some, make tune it manually, and and once you're happy, you end up with with SQL, SQL code that you can you can compile and run, um, and and they have strategies for exist other other existing codes as well. Kind of if you're if you're in Fortran, you you're you're stuck with OpenMP at the moment. You you kind of have to be able to write your code in in uh, C++ for this to work. Um, yeah, it's worth mentioning that they, they open source the compatibility tool and they call it um, So you can, you can find it on GitHub these days. Um, okay, so a little bit about the codes that we worked on. Um, so we had four different scientific applications in, in different fields. Some of these we were, already familiar with, and some of them not. Um, you can kind of see that they had uh, C, C++ CPU implementations, and then CUDA, CUDA or OpenCL GPU implementations. And our strategy for almost all of them was, was basically identify a hotspot, take that kernel, 
translate it into SQL and, and see what happens. I think for for uh, DG Poly 3D, Mackis went for the for the whole thing. Only one there. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, um, and right. So then, what happened? Oh, okay. So, so first, I wanted to talk about uh, the the code translation tools. So, so like I said, they provide a tool that will automatically translate CUDA kernels into SQL. And as we found some good things about it. Um, so it does do a bulk of the work correctly. So you manage to automate a lot of sort of manual syntax changes that you would have to go through and, and do by hand and, and get frustrated with. Um, um, it, it generates a very good report of, of changes that it did and, and sort of suggestions of, of things that you probably want to look at after, after it's done. Um, it, it does, it, it, so it hooks into your build system um, so, so you can sort of let it automatically work out your compiler commands and so on and it, it generates new make files for the SQL compiler to use. Um, um, which may or may not work. I think I believe that for the one API compiler it worked very well, and then for other compilers it worked less spectacularly. The uh, generation of automatic make files. Um, yeah, it supports other build system besides make, but there's less documentation, um, unfortunately. Um, and it uses. So, so in SQL, you have a couple of different versions for accessing memory, and, and it uses um, these explicit shared memory allocations by default, which is good if you're used to CUDA. Um, um, so the, the things, okay, so, so the sort of cons of, of using it is, is it often produces two general code, which is kind of fair enough. It, it kind of has to do that, but, but you, end up having to go through your code and like reduce the dimensions of your uh, ranges and and do other things to to sort of make it more readable um, this is maybe the 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 main 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 thing uh, we were not thrilled with is that it it in, injects some uh, uh, one api specific extensions to the SQL standard so it will so intel have their own extensions to SQL. I believe they're working on getting them added to the standard, but as of right now, they aren't there. So, so we often found that the code generated by this tool could only be compiled with one API, un unless you went through and, and threw away all of the Intel ex extensions it had, it had injected into your code. Um, there were also some, some cases where we didn't get error-free code. Um, most of the time it worked, but, but we found some edge cases where it, the code wouldn't actually compile and you would have to go and, and fix things. Um, we had one code on the previous slide, OpenMM, that, that did runtime compilation and, and code generation, and this did not play well with, with the uh, conversion tool. Um, it works best, yeah, when you when you when your source code is not split into lots and lots of files, and and the sort of explicit memory access is perhaps not the not the most ideal thing you would use if you're using SQL, when you, if you're writing SQL. So it kind of ties you down into this uh, way of thinking that is is not the most natural. So so in summary. We found that it, it did automate a lot of manual work, but, but it only takes you part of the way, and it, it doesn't eliminate the need for understanding like how, how SQL and CUDA work. So yeah, for unexperienced developers, it, it may uh, be, be a sort of a, a risk as well. Um, so how did, we, how did we do then with uh, portability? So, so I mentioned we, we did have to manually um, oh, okay, I will hurry up. Uh, we did have to manually strip away some of the Intel ex extensions that got, got inserted into our code. Um, and 
and so obviously compiling with with one API is is kind of guaranteed. Um, but one API, the the DPCPP compiler in one API only compiles for Intel hardware. Um, but Intel have a have a fork of of uh, LLVM that you can use to compile for uh, I believe Nvidia and AMD targets. Um, so we got that set up with with help from Cambridge, and and that worked for us as well. Um, then with the other backends, we ran we ran into a lot of issues. Um, so Hipsicle we managed to use for one of the codes. Uh, Compute CPP didn't doesn't support the 2020 standard, which we kind of took as a given <laughs> in the beginning, and and which for example includes the unified shared memory features. So that uh, didn't get anywhere. And then Hipsicle we found also had some some missing features. Um, then I want to show portability across hardware. Um, so again, like CPUs. Obviously, you you do quite well, but that's CPU, so you're not so interested. Um, for Intel GPUs, the ones who tried that got, were, were quite successful. For Nvi NVIDIA, because I want to say this is partly because we had good support from a from a HPC center with NVIDIA hardware, and and less so from AMD. We um, managed to managed to run most of the codes on NVIDIA and not none of them on AMD um, due to the issue issues with, with Hipsicle, basically. Um, I'm not really going to talk about performance because I don't have time. Um, I'll just show sort of the, the lessons we learned, um, which I mostly talked about. I want to say we did look at performance, and we got sort of mixed results. Some of the codes were faster, some of the codes were slower, some of the codes were a lot slower, and we found diagnosing these things was quite difficult. So the compilers, um, while, while DPCPP seems the most mature, a lot of them have, have sort of teething problems, and it can be difficult to work out exactly what they're doing. Um, and yeah, in, in six months, we kind of got up to speed, but not uh, very, very in-depth. Thank you. Let's go to the questions. So, uh, right once run anywhere is the promise of uh, multi arc uh, parallel frameworks. Uh, challenges are matching arc native performance and avoiding overly complicated abstractions to hide hardware, hardware differences. Do you have a sense for how SQL fares on these points? Um. I guess I can sort of give my personal feeling about that. Um, so I would, I definitely wouldn't expect to match Arch native performance. I think you can just forget about that right away. Um, but if you can get close enough, I think there's value because it allows you to run. <laughs> um, I think on on like overly complicated abstractions, SQL does quite well. So in the sense that they are not overly complicated. Um, I don't know, you have? Having worked with uh, uh, SQL, do you feel it has potential to replace existing accelerator frameworks, or is it adding another competing uh, standard? Oh, I, know like. <laughs> um, I think it has potential. I mean, any of these like uh, abstraction layers it really just depends on who's supporting it and who's using it um, and it seems like SQL has quite a lot of support from the industry um, the user base is maybe not quite there yet but if it if it picks up I think there is some potential for it to be useful and and like I said in the beginning uh, like the it the uh, DOE is it's like the recommended programming model for the Aurora machine, so I think there will be will be people using it. I like that one. Uh, were you able to find standard SQL alternatives to the one API specific translations that DBGT generated in all cases? Um, most cases, yes. So most cases, it seemed kind of unnecessary. It seemed like it's just doing it to 
tie you into the Intel toolchain for no reason. There was one thing with atomic operations that were that we were not able to to replace with standard SQL alternatives, but fortunately the the sort of Intel extensions come with a permissive license. I forget which one was it. LLVM license. Uh, uh, thanks. Um, yeah, so we we were just kind of able to pull those out into into our code base, and and then we could use them with any compilers. So we have time for one more question. Uh, what were the issues to compile for Intel GPUs? Arguably, Intel's to chain is tuned for that. Um, so I'm not entirely sure if there were issues. I think more like the issues were more with accessing the dev cloud. So we had accounts to the dev cloud, but because of like issues with with like um, basically you couldn't have CUDA on the dev cloud because in Intel can't put NVIDIA products on their dev cloud. Um, we, dis we, we decided, some of the teams decided to drop that and then by the time we had the code ready, our accounts had expired and we just kind of decided it's not worth going back. So yeah, I don't think there were major issues compiling with, with the Intel tool chain for Intel GPUs. Hmm? The, the lack of access. Yeah. Um, and yeah, also yeah, they don't they don't give you access to the new their like the new GPUs on the dev cloud, so it was not super interesting for us. Um, okay, thanks. Let's thank Thomas uh, once more.